Swashbucklers, you're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 60. My name is Phil Johnson. I'm your host of the show. Thank you once again for tuning in. I appreciate it. If you're new to the show, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, welcome back. We are here. We got a lot of good stuff to get to today. Uh, a lot of cool stuff I'm going to tell you about here. All right. And same, but first of all, this is episode number 60. So interesting fact about the number 60. Uh, the Babylonians, way back, they used a, a, a sexagesimal or a base 60 number system, uh, which also happens to sound super hot, right? Sexagesimal. Uh, base 60 number system. And uh, we might think, well, who cares? Well, it survives today in our measurements of like 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes of in an hour. We even use them in like the degrees, like a 360 degree circle or the 60 degree angles in the corner of an equilateral triangle, right? So we've got this old Babylonian base 60 sexagesimal number system that we're still using. And mathematically, 60 is not the new 40. So sorry. Anyway, my guests on the show today are Cindy Staveley and Captain Mayhem of the St. Augustine Pirate Museum, which is one of the, the largest collections of pirate artifacts like anywhere. And uh, we talk about where they got all the stuff, how they display it, uh, their, um, their, their attitude and their, their plan for uh, addressing all of the different aspects of pirate culture, uh, especially in a town like St. Augustine, which is like the, it's the oldest town in the country. Uh, and uh, it has a deep, deep pirate culture. So we dig into all that kind of stuff. It's a really, really great talk, and you're going to dig it. You're absolutely going to enjoy it. Uh, and uh, it's a this is a good episode to come in on, and what I mean by come in on, here's some good news. I got some good news for you today, big news. Uh, this show is now going to be syndicated on Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, which is a, a digital radio station that you can listen to online and all sorts of places and all that good stuff. And uh, I talked with David MacArthur over there, and he said, hey, we'd like to add your show to the lineup. So here's the plan, all right? So first of all, uh, here's here's the the rundown. Uh, this uh, Under the Crossbones is sponsored now by Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, uh, WKKC-DB. And they play the best music uh, and pirate radio talk, and it's, it's a great station. It's fun to listen to. And you can listen to this show, Under the Crossbones, on both their stations. So you can go to pirateradioofthetreasurecoast.com or pirateradiotc.com, and they've got apps. Uh, grab the Pirate Radio Treasure Coast app. That's their music station, which is where you'll be hearing the new weekly episodes of this show. and uh, Or the Pirate Radio Talk, which is their talk station. And on the talk station, you're going to be able to hear the back episodes of this show. So today's episode number 60, and I'm going to get them all the back 59 uh, to put on the station as well. So it's another place where you can listen to Under the Crossbones. Of course, you can still uh, subscribe through iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio, all your favorite podcasty type places. Uh, but now you'll also be able to hear us on Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, which is exciting. It's super fun uh, because it's going to be new new fans, new new listeners, new ears uh, on uh, on these great interviews and the comedy and the music, and uh, I'm, very, I'm very excited about it. It's going to be it's going to be cool. So I hope you're excited about it too. Uh, basically, you can keep listening to it wherever you like to listen to it. Right? That's the that's the bottom line. We want to be where you are. All right. Anyway. So that's good news. Uh, good shows over the weekend in Morgan Hill and in uh, Santa Rosa, California. Fun shows. I hadn't done a lot of gigs in September, so it was good. I got to go knock the cobwebs out a little bit. I did a bunch of new material. Uh, last night uh, at the uh, Santa Rosa show was the uh, first time I did all just all new materials. Nothing that was on my previous specials at all. It's all stuff I'm working on for the next hour, and uh, it went well. It went pretty well. A couple clunkers in there to work on but that's cool because i got plenty of places to work my clunkers out this month all right i got one more show in california this month and that is this coming saturday october the 8th at sugar barge in uh, bethel island california which should be lots of fun and then i'm off to uh the the ridiculous diagonal usa tour uh wednesday october the 12th i will be at the seven cedars casino in squim washington on Thursday, October the 13th, I will be at Union Square in Longview, Washington. Uh, if you know anybody in Longview, Washington, tell them to come to the show because I don't I don't have a lot of like mailing lists and people. I don't have a lot of people in Longview, uh, and I'm headlining this thing, and i got to get some people out. So if you know anybody there, let them know. Uh, Friday, October the 14th, I will be at the Seven Night Club in Bend, Oregon, which should be great. And then I jet diagonally across the country 
And uh, Wednesday, October the 26th, I will be at Tavolino Della Notte in Coral Springs, Florida. And then Thursday through Saturday, October the 27th through the 29th, I will be headlining at the Laugh-In Comedy Club in Fort Myers, Florida. So uh, if you're uh, one of those Florida pirates, come on out to either uh, Coral Springs or Fort Myers. Those are going to be great, great shows. And I hope you're digging the show. Uh, if you're new, like I said, I hope you enjoy it. It's going to be lots of fun. You're going to dig in. If you've been listening to the show, I um, uh, appreciate you being here. If you want to hook up with us online, you can check us out at uh, facebook.com slash under the crossbones, twitter.com slash under crossbones, no the. And of course, you can get all the show notes for this show at under the crossbones.com slash zero six zero. If you want to be a supporter of the show, like so many of you have, and I appreciate it. You can go to underthecrossbones.com slash support, and uh, uh, right there, there's a little PayPal box. You can just drop a donation in there, whatever you feel the show is worth to you. Uh, maybe the cost of a bottle of rum would be nice. You could donate that. There's also a little Amazon banner there, and if you click that Amazon banner, you buy yourself something nice, like an agro- above-ground pool or um, a boat for your for your tubby toys or a new stapler, perhaps. Whatever you buy yourself, whatever your thing is, you know, uh, Amazon gives me a little kickback. That helps support the show. That keeps our our lights on here at the Red Shed, and I appreciate it. If you want to be a sponsor of the show, uh, like uh, Pirate Radio, the Treasure Coast, we can absolutely hook you up with that. It's cheap. It's easy. Just contact me, and we'll get you going on that. That is underthecrossbones.com slash support. All right, so let's... Dig into the interview, shall we? This is a good one. You're going to totally enjoy it. This is Cindy Stavely and Captain Mayhem from the St. Augustine Pirate Museum. Here we go. This is uh, Cindy Stavely and Captain Mayhem from the St. Augustine Pirate Museum. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you, what the museum's about, what you've got, that kind of thing, and then we'll talk about how we got there. Okay, well, the St. Augustine Pirate and Treasure Museum is um, a collection of over 800 real artifacts and treasures from the golden age of piracy. It's actually one of the largest collections of its kind in the world. And some of the interesting art here, for example, are we have one of only three Jolly Roger flags that are left in the world today. Mm. And we have only real pirate treasure chests that actually belong to a real pirate that we know for sure. And that's um, a big iron chest that belonged to Captain Thomas too. Oh, okay. That, those are just two of the highlights among a lot of the artifacts that we have, but everything is set in a really interactive, immersive setting. So our guests come in, and they're not just walking around looking at artifacts behind glass cases. There's a lot of them that they can actually touch and handle. We've got cannons rigged up that they can actually fire, um, muskets that they can see how heavy they are, some other weapons that are on our ship's deck that they can actually play with. Plus some high-tech interactives as well that people really enjoy. That's great. That sounds fantastically fun. The entire museum is is broken up into several different rooms, each one of them a different theme. Port Royal Jamaica would be one. The tavern would be another. Captain's Deck, where we talk about Captain William Kidd, with all the artifacts we have of him, his personal keepsake box, his um, Bible with his name, his family name, and printed on the cover of the Bible, over 300 years old. Uh, one of Mr. Croce's prized possessions is a is a 300 and how many years is it? It's 1684, 332 year old book, Buccaneers of America, a true account, a uh, true accounting of all the pirates from the 1600s prior to 1680. Nice. That was very yeah. That was the very very first object that he bought when he started collecting all of these artifacts over 30 years ago. We also have execution dock. We have a gun deck. Uh, a shipwreck island where we have treasures from the Atosha and the Santa Margarita. Those are both shipwrecks from the 1620s. Um, and then, of course, we have a dedication to Hollywood pirates because Mr. Croce really first got the pirate bug when he was a young lad and he actually saw the movie Captain Blood starring the great Errol Flynn. That's and we have, have the jacket that was worn by Errol Flynn here in the, mo- in the museum. Oh, wow. That's really cool. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the museum. When did it open and where did the artifacts come from? Well, Pat Croce, the owner, has been collecting these artifacts for over 30 years. And for the longest time, he just kept them as a private collection in his home outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, In 2004, he decided he was going to open a pirate and treasure museum in Key West, Florida. And it was opened as Pirate Soul. 
If anybody knows anything about QS, QS is typically not a place for people to come to see museums. It's a um, drinking kind of a town and water sports kind of a town. <laughs> when the opportunity came in early 2010 for him to buy a piece of property in downtown St. Augustine, located right across the road from the Castillo de San Marcos Fort that was actually built by the Spanish to protect the town from pirates. Um, this building was in disrepair and had been vacant for a few years, but he was able to purchase this building that we're in now. And we opened in December of 2010 as the St. Augustine Pirate and Treasure Museum. I know you have, like you said, you have one of the three uh, only surviving actual Jolly Roger flags out there. Who did, do you know who that one belonged to? We don't know who it belonged to. He bought it from a private collector, but at some point it went through, there's a relationship with that flag and Jacques Cousteau, but we're not sure exactly what that relationship is. Okay. The famous pirate, Jacques Cousteau. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't know what pirate it be, belonged to. Um, it's actually very rare for a flag to survive um, from sure. being flown off of a ship. That's why there's so few of them left because, you know, material so vulnerable to the weather and the salt water and everything like that. But they would have, one, most flags would have probably gone down with the ship anyway. Yeah. Um, right. It is, the, it is noted that it is the only one in the United States. The other two are not even in the United States. Oh, okay. I think one of the interesting things about the flag that you guys have is that it looks so much more uh, primitive than the Jolly Roger that we picture because we have such great artists doing those types of graphics today that when you look at that one, you go, oh, I, those guys couldn't draw, could they? <laughs> we do school tours in here in the museum. We do a thousand plus school tours a year in the museum. And one of the most common things that come about from all, this, all the kids that come here, and we're talking about fourth and fifth grade children, they come through here and the flag's not going to be scary to them because they're so used to all the things that they see now. Sure. Um, but you have to think that if you were on a, sh on a sailing ship and a ship was chasing you down and that flag was flying, uh, you'd be shaking in your knickers, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I imagine that it, you know, I mean, the art skills don't really matter that much. As soon as they saw the black flag with any sort of uh, death face on it, they would know what it meant and they didn't care about, they wouldn't go, they wouldn't judge the art. They wouldn't be like, well, that one's not that scary, so maybe they'll be okay. Uh, you're absolutely right. And many Jolly Roger flags were designed by the pirates themselves to reflect their own, it, it's like their own fashion design, their own fashion statement. Sure. A lot of, I mean, if you see the one with the side going, the head going sideways and the, and the two swords, that would be Henry Every, and Jack Rackham was the head forward with the two swords. Um, Thomas Two had one where he's, it's just an arm, you know, flexed arm, uh -huh. a dagger, and Blackbeard was a whole body spearing a heart. So there's a lot of different images that were the brands of the pirates of the day, too, and, and they got to the point where I guess their egos came in and they wanted to be able to identify their own pirate brand as they were sailing around plundering the seas. Certainly. Yeah, I imagine ego played into everything they did pretty much. <laughs> well, it does that with just about every criminal. That's you true. Might also, it'd be curious to know that the, the, the flag of Calico Jack Rackham is the skull with the, with the cross cutlasses. Uh -huh. It is probably the most recognized because of the fact that Disney kind of used that so that flag for just about everything they did. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Disney, I, Disney has had has played such a large part in um, turning kids onto pirates that it's it's almost unavoidable. And I know you guys have a section that's sort of devoted to the movie section of things, uh, whether that be Captain Blood or Car Pirates of the Caribbean, things like that. What kind of stuff do you have in there? We do have a sword that was used in the first movie, Pirates of the Caribbean. That um, It's a prop sword, and it's really kind of cool. When we first got it, um, we were playing around with it because it's retractable. If you go to stab somebody, the blade retracts into it ah. itself. Um, we have that on display as well as one of the cursed coins from the movies. And a couple of Barbosa's weapons that he wore, um, you know, we, there, we have a picture of him with the same... With the same blunderbuss in his belt, but then the actual blunderbuss that we have, um, imagine my surprise the first time I went to clean it to find out that it was totally made of rubber. <laughs> so Hollywood props are props, and, and um, Pat has a good enough relationship from people out in Hollywood that he's always able to obtain some things. And we have some hooks from the movie Hook, the two, hook move, the two hooks from the two different movie Hook. Um, we've got some 
drop some things from the Goonies that are all, that people love that, and some movie posters and a softball jersey from the, one of the from, Hook movies. The Hook movie with Dustin Hoffman and yeah. uh, Robin Williams. Yeah, one of my favorites. The sword, uh, according to some stories, the sword that we have, which I always tell all the tours that we bring through here, is the sword of the great Jack Sparrow. But if you remember the scene where Sparrow and Barbosa were in the Cavern of the Treasures towards the end of the movie and Sparrow stabbed Barbosa in the heart, uh huh. that's the sword that they used. We have that sword. Oh, fantastic. That's really great. I, I like that you have the mix of like really, really authentic period stuff and then aren't you don't shy away from the, the, the Hollywood end of it either because they sort of so go together in popular culture. But some people are – if they're really traditional period, historical, they they should really shy away from the Hollywood thing. So I like to see that mix. I think that's really cool. And we definitely have that, that line of demarcation here because St. Augustine being known for its history of 450 years, we have people here that, that are very staunch and strict in their – in their plane of historical events and things that go on here. Mm -hmm. So the Pirate Museum fits in well with it because it stays within that realm of authenticity. Um, It's not like it's a bunch of pirates that went down to Fredericks of Hollywood and bought their pirate outfits and and are now parading them around and and looking like they are all at a Halloween party. We have pirates that are here in St. Augustine who try to stay with as much of that authenticity as possible and do quite a few charitable things around town, too, and are very community involved. Interesting. It is a good mix. It's a very good mix. And in in our Hollywood pirates, we also do dispel a lot of the myths of real versus non real, you know, fact fiction, so that people understand that maybe what they, they've seen or heard in pirate museums is not actually the way that real pirates conducted their lives and, you know, the way that they spoke or whatever, but it, it, it does a good job of dispelling the fact from fiction. Uh, and a, a really good one for that would probably be the word R. Everybody, <laughs> if I had a dime for everyone that said R to me, I, I could <laughs> work. But in actuality, we have no recordings of what, what or how pirates spoke in the 16 or 1700s. But a movie called uh, 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 Long John Silver starring the great Robert Newton where he did his research and tried to figure out how pirates might have spoke. Um, we, when we first opened the, the museum, we had a big, long diatribe on Facebook with people all weighing in on how, how the idea of R came about. And it, it's pretty interesting that most people would think, but pretty much it came from that movie when Robert Newton just kind of made a mistake and in frustration said R and there it was. Plain and simple. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, it, it's lent some great jokes to us over the years, but um, it, it is, it is not anything. And I always tell everybody in my tours, uh, all the ship's logs and the captain's logs and everything else. I've never read any pirate having ever written in their log. I, today we're out of rum. R. <laughs> just, you know, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> And the spelling would have been all weird anyway because they spelled everything weird back then. I and the, the 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 letter R would have been backwards like Toys R Us. <laughs> That's great. So Saint Augustine is, if I'm not mistaken, the oldest city in in the country, correct? Yes, it's the oldest continuously inhabited Euro- inhabited European settlement in the United States. And so there's a lot of pirate history there. Is it a city that sort of embraces its pirate history, or are they like Bristol and they kind of shun the pirate history? Uh, I think it depends on who you're talking it depends to. On, it does depend on who you're talking to. Let, I'll give you my uh, an example in, in my own personal instance. I've been doing pirate now for 10 years. When I first came back, I'm from St. Augustine, my, my hometown. This is I was born and raised here. Uh-huh. My family history goes all the way back 200 plus years. But when I started doing pirate things, when I came back home in 2006, it was not an easy thing to do because of the staunchness of some of the reenactors here. Um, the Pirate Museum had the input here in 2010, added some legitimacy to it, and the fact that what I do with the Pirate Museum and then what, what I do with some of the other pirates, I, I, I try to be my, as mindful as possible and respectful as possible to the other reenactors and the history of my own hometown. Um, and by doing that, it has given me at least a respectful standing amongst the reenactors. 
Um, and I don't have, uh, and the Pirate Museum has in no way, shape, or form any problem with the reenactors. So it does work ha well hand in hand as long as we, on both sides, know where the line of authenticity is and where the line of movie history is. Uh huh. If that makes sense at all. When, yeah, it does. When we first moved here, I mean, I've, I've lived and worked in the tourism industry and, and mu other museums in St. Augustine for almost 20 years. And people are candid with me. And, and I know that when we first were talking about opening, people were thinking that it was going to be like Disney's coming to St. Augustine. It's going to be <laughs> cheesy. It's going to be hacky. But once we opened and the community was able to actually come in and see what a, um authentic and you know, really great experience that we offered here, that that kind of dissolved, that thought kind of dissolved and everybody really embraced the quality that we brought here and the authenticity as well. But before we opened, there were some, you know, there were some raised eyebrows and like, you know, people shaking their heads, but we've been able to overcome that pretty quickly. And the, the, the biggest fear more than anything else that they, they had, and understandably so, and I share that because it is my hometown, but the biggest fear was you open the door on this pirate thing and then all of St. Augustine, the oldest city in the United States with so much respected history, becomes Disney-fied. Yeah. And that was, that was the fear. But those of us that, are, that do the pirate reenactment or the pirate things, as long as we maintain certain decorums and respectfulness, some of the pirate things that I do that are even not that are part of the museum or sometimes away from the museum. We even do things to incorporate the royal family of St. Augustine in those things so that we're showing the city of St. Augustine and the reenactors that, that we want to be a part of it. We don't want to be a problem of it. That makes sense. Now, I didn't know St. Augustine had a royal family. Tell me about that. Uh, well, it's the royal family um, from Spain. Spain. Okay. They honor every year. They have a new prince and queen and prince and, and the other parts of the family. They're, they're, locals, the they're locals that play the part of the royal family that would have been the royal family at the time of St. Augustine's beginning in 1565. Interesting. And, it, and they typically only choose people that are descended from um, what are called Menorcans, that are of Menorcan descent, which is a um, part of our population that's descended from a group of people that were here back in the 1700s that migrated here from Europe and... Um, developed a, a, a really strong Spanish Menorcan culture here that still exists to this day. Interesting. That's fantastic. So it, it does sound like it's a city that really embraces its history in one form or another. Absolutely. Oh, completely. A every day. You, 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 can't, you can't have anything happening without the history, history of St. Augustine being a, a part of something that's going on here. Nice. So we're that's here great. right now looking out the window of my office looking at a, a fort that was built by the Spanish in the late 1600s um, to protect St. Augustine from not just pirates but other attacks and it still stands here today and it's such an iconic piece of history and it's one of the only monuments that's an actual national park. Oh, interesting. That's great. I am, uh, I'm going to be in Florida in October doing some tour dates and I'm, I'm, I really want to drive down and see all of, all, those, all this great stuff you guys have because I'm getting really excited now. <laughs> Where in Florida will you be? Uh, lots of places. Uh, Miami, Fort Myers, Orlando. I've got a couple weeks worth of tour dates happening out there. So I'll be doing a bunch of driving around anyway. Well, you'll have to come and be our guest here at the museum then. I hope I definitely can. So, Cindy, you were saying that you've been working in, in various sort of tourism things for 20 years or so. Were you a piratey person before that? How much knowledge did you have about the subject? Um, pretty much none. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I was chosen for my for my ability to to you know run and market attractions here. But it's been it's been great learning about pirates in, in the meantime. But yeah, I, I you know I, I worked at an alligator farm. I um, worked for educational tour company. I ran a ghost tour company. I ran an old jail here in St. Augustine. Huh. And um. Now I'm here, so I've done all kinds of wonderful, crazy things since I've been here in Florida, and um, this has absolutely been an amazing journey for sure. That's cool, and I'm willing to bet that this museum is far safer than the alligator farm. 
Yes, for sure. And I won't even go into the story about my friend that did lose his arm while we were working there. So that's another oh gosh. incident with a Cuban crocodile. Yikes. Yeah, no, that's no good. Uh, did he get a hook after? That's all I want to know. He <laughs> makes a fine pirate now. He did. <laughs> Actually, after that, when I was running that ghost tour company, he um, would would come and do tours for the ghost tours through town, and he would wear a hook. Funny. That's Kids great. Loved it. I'm sure they did, yeah. So I was reading on your website that your your latest exhibit is of the Red Sea Pirates. What can you tell me about that exhibit? It's some artifacts from the Red Sea. The Red Sea was one of the last places that were plundered in the Golden Age of Piracy. Um, Pat, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on the actual specific history of it? Thomas II, uh, William Kidd, Henry Every, those pirates went to the Red Sea to do their plundering and pillaging primarily because the people of the, of the country of India or some of the other countries around would do their pilgrimages to Mecca every year. And when these families would go on their pilgrimages, they would take all of their earthly belongings with them, and they'd be on these, these ships. And the Indian moguls uh, were quite wealthy also, and these ships had, had treasures far beyond anything they found in the Atlantic Ocean. So these are treasures that they actually went after. They, and it is another reason why Madagascar um, is one of the places that we can talk about with pirate activity because the pirates would then go through the, Indi- uh, the, the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean and then they'd go to Madagascar and kind of count up and divide up their booty and, and fence it to anybody in the area they could and then go back to the sea for more. The three most noted pirates that I can think of off the top of my head right now are William Kidd, Henry Every, and Thomas II. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are several others, and for the life of me, their names have just en- left my head right now. <laughs> but uh, those are the most notable. Those are the most notable ones, especially Thomas II was 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 from uh, Newport, Rhode Island. He was uh, he was from the colonies in si- in the 1690s. So, and he was like a rock star. He would go out on these adventures and come back, and the governors of New York and Pennsylvania would invite him to their to their soirees, and he would just regale everybody with his tales of being a pirate. He was like a rock star. Um, but then he lost his life in the out there in the in the Red Sea in the Indian Ocean. Um, he took a cannonball to the gut. That'll do it. That that will do it. That, 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 they buried him in the ocean that year, 1695, with a hole in him. <laughs> Interesting. I, I was looking at the pictures on your website, and the dagger that you've got in that collection is amazing looking. Yeah, that's a beautiful one. That's a nice piece of work. And the thing I like about it is back then, you know, th- men, I guess men were smaller, so that dagger fits my small hand perfectly. Oh, interesting. Well, if anybody tries to break into the museum, now now you know what you can use. It was made for me. There you go. <laughs> uh, the, and the conservation on it is amazing. I mean... Uh, I don't know who did the conservation on it, but it's it looks practically brand new at this point. I mean, all of these artifacts that Pat's been collecting, he has been able to collect them from from auction houses and other museums. So almost everything has come in museum, you know, condition. And and if it hasn't, he's taken it to be preser- conserved. Especially that flag. When he first got a hold of the flag, it was just sitting folded up in somebody's home. Oh. And. When he got it, the condition of the material, the fabric, was so poor that if he just touched it, his finger would go through it. Ooh. But he sent it to the University of Pennsylvania to have it conserved, and they did a great job, you know, putting you know putting it up there and and putting it in that hermetically sealed case so that it stays preserved for for years to come for people to come and enjoy. Fantastic. Well, that's great, and uh, I really want to definitely come down and see it. So your website is thepiratemuseum.com. dot com. Uh, which is a good domain, good score on that one. Uh, that's probably a tough one to get. And uh, and uh, thanks for coming on. This has been really fun. Did I? Is there anything I didn't ask about that you want people to know about? I, the only thing I can think of is just tell everybody that this is the most unique museum on pirate history. I tell everybody it's the largest pirate museum in the world, not by its physical size, but by its content, because we have 840 artifacts on pirate history here. That is the largest collection. That's really great. Well, thanks so much, you guys. I hope uh, I can uh, see you when I come down there, and I hope we can talk again soon. That you, sounds great. Do you drink rum? No, I don't. I'm a teetotaler. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll drink your share then. There you go. All right. Thanks, you guys. You're very All welcome. right. Thank All you. Right.
Bye-bye. Bye-bye. There it is, friends. That is my interview with Cindy Stavely and Captain Mayhem of the St. Augustine Pirate Museum. Uh, I'm hoping I get a chance to go down there on this trip. I don't know some dates moved around, but I'm going to, I'm going to give it a shot. And, uh, but if you're in the area, you should definitely check it out. Uh, you can find out all about them at the pirate museum.com, right? The pirate museum.com for the St. Augustine pirate museum. Uh, that is going to be absolutely fantastic. And there, my friends, there are real pirates out there and they are not, uh, they are not dressed well. They do not have a parrot on their shoulder nor a sword in their sheath by their side. Uh, they are uh, sitting in sweatpants in somebody's basement eating Cheetos and trying to steal your identity, and it's a drag, man. It's happened to me. It's happened. Yeah, I get uh, every so often something something will pop up. It happens because we're all on the Internet now, and that's where they steal your identity from, right? I don't want it to happen to you, so all you have to do is get yourself a LifeLock membership. LifeLock goes out to the dark, ugly parts of the web, and they make sure that your information isn't out there. And if it is out there, they'll help you fix it, and that's the real big thing that they do for you so it's cheap it's easy it's kind of the cost of doing business these days uh you can get 10 percent off a lifelock membership all you got to do is go to under the crossbones.com slash lifelock click the green start your membership button and you will get yourself 10 percent off easy peasy for sheezy yeah uh i also have an ebook for you cool ebook it is uh alexander squimlin's pirates of panama or buccaneers of america uh whichever title you prefer it's out there under both. And uh, if you've never read it, it is a fantastic piece of period writing from the golden age of piracy. Uh, and uh, it's all about the, the guys that were happening at that time. It's a really great piece of text that you should check out. And uh, you can get it for free. Go to underthecrossbones.com, click on the free ebook button, and you can check it out. Or if you're out and about, uh, you're not somewhere where you want to be all typey typey, websitey websitey, just use your phone. Real easy. Text the word pirate. And your email address to 94253. That's easy, easy, easy. Text the word pirate and your email address to 94253. All right. We got some comedy and music on the show today, of course. Now, here's the thing. Uh, With this new Pirate Radio and the Treasure Coast deal, the new episodes are going to show up on their music station each week, okay, where they have a license uh, to play the music and the comedy and the stuff that I add into the show. The back episodes, so the previous 59 before this, are going to be played on their talk station where that music license uh, doesn't exist. And so the old episodes that you'll hear won't have the comedy and music in them. They'll just have the interview and the the me yakky parts. Um, And I'm trying to, I'm going to, I have to go back and do a bunch of editing on the old episodes to make that happen. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how smooth that transition is going to be just yet. It might take a little bit of experimentation to get it right, but just so you know what's happening, if you're listening over on pirate radio of the treasure coast uh, to old episodes, you won't hear the comedy and the music, even though I might, you might hear me talk about the comedy and the music. All right. So anyway, that's, that's what we got going today though. We got comedy from Adam Fuhrberg, Fuhrberg, man, his last name is hard to say. Adam Fuhrberg. And uh, very funny dude. Met him at the World Series of Comedy uh, last month in Las Vegas. Very, uh, very uh, smart comic. And I think you're going to dig it. And I'm going to play you a clip of his stuff today. You can find him at adamfuerberg.com. His last name is F-E-U-E-R-B-E-R-G, right? Yeah, just go to the uh, show notes <laughs> to get the link. It's going to be the easy way to do it. Uh, show notes under the crossbones.com slash 060. And we're going to hear uh, music from a band called Resender. Uh, today we're going to hear a song uh, by them called Body, and Resinder's interesting. Uh, it's uh, it's a, the moniker of uh, songwriter Paul Conroy, who's a San Francisco guy. But uh, the the group started when he bought uh, an old mandolin in Stuttgart, Germany, and he started street performing, uh, writing songs on the street, and bridges, and things like that, and uh, turned it into a band. Now he's in San Francisco doing great things. So we're going to hear his song body from his latest album and it's going to be great all right let's dig in comedy from adam fuerberg and the song body by resender check it out uh i still get carded when i go to bars and restaurants because apparently it's cool to hire blind people to work at places like that. i feel like nowadays when i get carded it's not to see if i'm 21 it's just to see if i'm also bald in the picture like, when i look around my apartment It looks like it belongs to the world's most successful 14-year-old boy. I don't know about 30-year-old me, 14-year-old me, super proud of the Ghostbusters Lego set. A lot of 14-year-olds tonight. Awesome, guys. Thanks for for sneaking by security and ordering alcohol. All right. Drink up, everybody. That's what's up. 
Uh, I don't know about 30 year old me, 14 year old me, super into having eight controllers to play Super Smash Brothers. That's, that's right. Uh, truth be told, when that game came out, didn't go to work, stayed home, ate mushrooms, and played it all day. Yes. <laughs> It was amazing. I uh, like the woos on that. Now I know who's holding. Uh, and I have cash. Um, they were good mushrooms too, man. Didn't turn on the game once. Played it all day. It was... And when we are 10,000 miles away from home And nobody here knows your name how can you close your eyes? But we gotta sleep tonight And I slipped into a nightmare I'd rather forget about but these dreams have their habits of staying In my head, God, they're in there now What I recall, I won't repeat No, oh, oh, oh Only long nights, no sleep And when we are 10,000 miles away
And that's our show for today, friends. Thank you once again for tuning in. Make sure you go check out the show notes for everything that happened here today on uh, underthecrossbones.com slash zero six zero. If you want to find out more about the St. Augustine Pirate Museum, and I know you do, go to thepiratemuseum.com. If you want to hear more from Adam Fuerberg, the comedian, go to adamfuerberg.com. Again, that's F-E-U-E. Uh, shoot, I messed it up even. Adam Fuerberg, F-E-U-E-R-B-E-R-G. It's a tough one. Just go to the show notes. Click the link there. And if you want to hear more music from Resender, uh, who do great stuff, uh, go to Resender Music, and their uh, name is R-E-I-S-E-N-D-E-R. Again, just come to the show notes under thecrossbones.com slash 060. Links to everything there and all that kind of fun stuff. All right. Welcome to all the new listeners, and I'll see you next week. Bye.